And the word cheap for us is precisely a, a, a way of describing how capitalism avoids paying its bills. Mm. When you look at the food system, you can see that it is organized so that uh, you know, the urban proletariat, you know, the, the working class in cities in particular, mm. get access to cheap food as a tool of control. Well, it shouldn't be the Anthropocene. It, mm. This should be the Capitalocene. Mm. Uh, and if we call it the Capitalocene, then actually you're in a much better place because it's not all humans who are part of the problem here. There are indigenous civilizations that would never think of doing something like this. Uh, and indigenous people are humans. Uh, and so it's wrong to say, well, this is Anthropocene because uh, you know, here are some humans who are not doing that. It's the capitalist system that's driving this. And therefore, let's call it the Capitalocene because it's a much, much more accurate word. I'm interested in the idea of the low carbon economy um, that is made possible by regimes of care that are radically egalitarian. Uh, and if there is a generalization of that idea, I'm all for it. Mm. Uh, but I also think that, that again, we, we, you can't have this generalization without remembering how we got here. Otherwise, we, we fall back into this idea of you know, the, the capitalist amnesia. Uh, and that's what worries me about degrowth. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Circular Metabolism podcast, the bi-weekly meeting where we have in-depth discussions with researchers, policymakers, and practitioners to better understand the metabolism of our societies, or in other words, their resource use and pollution emissions, and how to reduce them in a systemic, socially just, and context-specific way. I'm your host, Aristide, from Metabolism of Cities, and today we're going to try to unmask the true cost of cheapness in our societies. Over the last decades or even centuries, a small part of the planet has been enjoying more and more cheap stuff. From sugar to coffee to energy, everything seems to get cheaper. However, to keep these, uh, these prices low, something has to give. Nature, care, labor and even lives are some of the elements capitalism needed to make cheap in order to perpetuate itself. However, what happens when we run, <laughs> run out of things, land and people to make cheap, to guide us through this uh, systemic forces of this hyper exploitation and propose a path out of it, I have the immense pleasure to talk with Raj Patel. Raj is an award-winning author, filmmaker and academic. He is research professor at the Lyndon Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. And he is the author of Stuff and Starve. I realize I forgot to bring the, the book. But uh, he's also the co-author of Jason Moore of the book A History of the Word in Seven Cheap Things. And just before we start, I would like to thank Andreas from the EEB, the uh, en uh, European Environmental Bureau, uh, which is the largest network of environmental citizens organizations. And they are also the co-organizer of the Beyond Growth Conference which this talk is uh, uh, framed within. So with all that out of the way, welcome Raj to the podcast. Thanks so much, Aristide. It's good to meet you. I'm very excited. I'll try to make interesting questions because I'm, <laughs> I'm so excited. I might miss the, the, the beat. But before we dive in into word ecology, to cheapness, to structural uh, relationships between society and nature, I want to ask you about your journey. Um, how did you arrive into... Focusing on these topics, going from economics to sociology to uh, activism, what led you? Was it was there a turning point, or was it a gradual process of things that ticked and made you be interested in all of this? Um, it was a bit of both, uh, Aristide. So the, initially, I uh, I came to understand. Uh, the inequities of poverty in the food system when I was five. Uh, and I, I, was, I was in India uh, in the land of my ancestors and uh, there was a, a young girl begging at a, 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 you know, at a traffic light um, and it was monsoon and I was inside a car with my parents and this girl was you know, sort of keening against the, the door with a little infant uh, you know, knocking at the window saying, look, we're hungry, we're poor, you know, give us something. Uh, and I looked up at her and I just lost my mind. I got very, very upset. Uh, and eventually, you know, my parents cracked down the window and you know, sort of posted some money outside and then off, off we drove. Uh, but then after that, in, in England, I, I started renting out my toys in school for, uh, to, to, for the money to give to charity. Uh, and since that moment, uh, I've been just 
trying to figure out what is the best way to stop that feeling. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I was an activist in my teens, uh, and you know, in, in Thatcher's Britain, uh, that was a, a you know a, a real initiation into you know, really what class struggle was, but also what race was. And I think that mm. that's uh, something that you know it, it was very interesting to be both on the inside of uh, a deep loathing of Thatcher, but also on the outside. Uh, of not recognizing myself in many of the movements that were, um, you know, the, the, whose meeting eyes I was sort of sidling into. Um, but I also, you know, I, I, I was a technocrat when I was a teen, <laughs> and I thought, look, maybe the, the right it, policy hadn't been written or mm. the right uh, way of understanding the system of the world hadn't been done. So I thought, well, you know, you can change the system from within somehow. And yeah. All I needed was the tools. Yeah, uh, exactly. And so initially I, I thought mathematics was the way to go and then economics. Um, and since then, uh, and so with more exposure to more of the social movements that had interesting questions to ask about, well, you know, if, te if te technocracy is so good, why hasn't it been working? Uh, and does it matter that people have to agree to something? Uh, and you know, increasingly the answer, well, yes, this is how hegemony works. You need... Uh, a movement to be able to secure power. You can't just write an equation and, and then you know, go off to the beach. Uh, and that understanding that, in fact, uh, the work of change happens through social movements uh, has meant that I'm, I'm spending more and more time working with uh, peasant movements, with um, uh, movements of uh, people who live in shacks, for example. And that kind of work is meant that I moved through you know, UN organizations and NGOs, but now spend my time uh, both working with social movements, mm. um, but also uh, on the outside trying to explain to people how they might join, why they must join, and how it is that the, the various kinds of lives that I once believed uh, need to be put in a coffin once and for all. Mm -hmm. and, and you mentioned... Um so food and social injustice are kind of the two core pillars that you're focused, I think, throughout your career, That's right? That's right, yes. Yeah, so why so? I mean, you said, you know, the, the, mm. this deep memory that you have as a, as a kid, right? Mm. So perhaps this kind of... Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I, initially, I wanted to do cities, like you, right? <laughs> I, I, uh -huh. I, I uh, was very interested in the metabolism of cities. Uh, uh -huh. And it happened through a couple of accidents that, that I found myself spending more and more time with social movements. So uh, I was in Seattle in 1999 at the mm -hmm. World Trade Organization protests. Um, I was there because I was working with uh, uh, an organization called Seatini, which was the Southern and East African Trade Informations and Negotiations Initiative. Uh, but essentially what we were doing was working with civil servants in the Southern and East African region to help them understand that they didn't have to sell out their countries when they were at the World Trade Organization, for instance. Um, and it's very tempting to do that because you know, the civil services in these countries are very under-resourced and they are you know, often bombarded with all these proposals from the European Union or from the United mm. States uh, through the World Trade Organization. And a lot of it didn't make any sense. And so they didn't realize what was at stake by agreeing to intellectual property rights provisions or you know, the agreement on agriculture. Um, and what we, you know, but, what we, but, but you had to be in the inside and know the the lingo. Oh, absolutely, to, to yeah, no, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, this, this was a way of uh, me committing class suicide, right? Mm. I mean, I, I'd spent a lot of time uh, learning this lingo uh, and realizing that if I was going to deploy this language within the organization, I would be engaging in various kinds of compromise, uh, and I didn't have a constituency to be able to betray, uh, and that, uh, you know, th th those realizations meant, well, look, at least I can do something with this language. I can teach other people about it. Uh, so that's that's exactly right, Aristide. It, it is a facility with this insider language that then mm. I, I was able to, to sort of stand on the outside. So anyway, I, I was in um, Seattle in 99 uh, as part of the Zimbabwean trade delegation. But I was also working with the, uh, what was then, Indie Media, um, this independent media organization that um, you know, w was one of the first to be able to push the idea of Web 2.0, where anyone mm. could publish anything. Uh, and in 1999, that was a very new and exciting <laughs> thing. Um, so I was writing articles and sort of getting the word out about what was happening in, uh, in Seattle. Uh, and on the streets, you know, I was wearing black, uh, a very professional looking black, but it was black. Uh, and that's important because mm. you could go inside and look 
you know, like you were hip, but go outside and look like you were part of the part of the protest. Um, and I was going inside and outside, uh, w very interested in what movements like La Via Campesina were doing. So although I wasn't really specifically focusing on food, mm. uh, it looked like the movements that had the most interesting things to say about globalization in general um, and about this sort of process of capitalist extraction were the ones who are engaged in food and agriculture and, and fisheries as well. Uh, so those movements are the ones that I spent more and more time with. And then mm -hmm. by accident, uh, I got a job uh, at an organization called Food First. Um, so after I finished my doctoral work, I was a policy analyst mm -hmm. uh, at an organization that uh, worked with more social movements, and in particular worked with La Via Campesina. Um, mm -hmm. So that was how, how it is that I, I really got steered towards the food world. It wasn't yeah. uh, fully intentional. It was you know, partly accident and partly you know, I, I knew some of the language that was useful in translating this very obscure organization to, <laughs> um, you know, to, to a broader audience. Yeah, in real concrete challenges mm -hmm. as well. Uh, um, so I, yesterday in your panel, this uh, this term and this process of cheapness was brought up mm. uh, a number of times uh, by yourself, but not only by yourself, but many of your co-panelists. And I think uh, it's, it is a, a lens that enables us to look at the word, understand the word. It enables us to, to see a number of webs, uh, be, it, be them social, be them economic, be them natural, and they're all intermingled somehow. And I think you uh, and your co-author propose uh, a nice, a nice uh, story to, to understand, to re-understand the word. Uh, mm -hmm. in, let's say in this history of 500 uh, years, right? Um, I think it's important to, to perhaps explain how do you, why cheap, what, what is so important about the, the cheap, the adjective cheap in all of this. Um, what led you to think you needed this concept? How did you? How was the discussion? What 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 was the story back there? So I mean, I was you know, very much focused on the idea of cheap food, uh, and when you look at the food system, you can see that it is organized so that uh, you know the urban proletariat, you know the the working class in cities in particular, mm. get access to cheap food as a tool of control. Um, and this, is, you know, this isn't a particularly capitalist phenomenon. You can read about it in China, you know, ancient China. You can read about it in, uh, in the Rome. Roman Empire. Yeah, the whole exactly. Thing, right? yeah. Um, so it, you know, it, it's not new that ruling classes have anxieties about what poor people will do if they're not hungry. But uh, the way that capitalism has structured relationships between rural and urban spaces, and even encourages us to think about those places using these words, is very novel, um, mm. and that's something that the you know the my first book stuffed and starved was mm. was very interested in. I was looking really at the supply chain of you know from field to um, to, to plate. But uh, Jason was working not just on cheap food, but also a sort of broader context of how uh, cheap. Uh, well, he, I mean, he, he was looking at cheap nature, cheap food, uh, cheap energy, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the, uh, the the fourth one for, for, for the moment. Oh, cheap work, of course, cheap labor. Uh, uh, now, th this I, th these ideas. Uh, you know, he, he came to the University of Texas. Mm. Uh, we met. You know, we, we we saw each other over a, a conference room. Our eyes locked and uh, <laughs> you know we we, uh, we we became we became good friends and we started exploring some of these ideas of cheapness um, and the word cheap for us is precisely a, a way of describing how capitalism avoids paying its bills mm -hmm. um, uh, J Jason's uh, ideas uh, in, uh, you know, in in some of his previous work was really sort of pointing to the idea that uh, the way capitalism has structured has always been about providing, uh, of generating processes of exploitation and extraction um, that allow the accumulation of, uh, of resources and then the, the extraction of profit through uh, you know, cycles of, of exchange, of, of, of capitalist exchange, that, uh, that allow the accumulation of profit. Now, uh, what we did is essentially marry all those ideas together uh, and then recognize that there, there are a few really uh, sort of missing ideas in, in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, one that we're, we're very much uh, agreed on is the idea of cheap care. Uh, you can't have a capitalist system without the, without the provision of cheap care, which is usually coded under patriarchy as women's work. Uh, now, that work is... 
uh, taken for granted you know, by uh, not just by capitalism, but often um, you know, absent the world of work, of, particularly of, of, of uh, Silvia Federici, um, e- even by certain kinds of Marxists. Um, and uh, Maria uh, Mies uh, also is, has, has an incredible work here that we, we drew on uh, to be able to build that chapter. Uh, and then we, there were a couple of other things that, that were, were quite important for us. We were interested in the idea of cheapness when it came to money, um, mm. because money itself uh, it became a sort of, to use Polanyi's terms, a sort of fictitious commodity. Um, and we were interested also in the racial implications of this. Um, and so we looked at the book in uh, at cheap lives. Uh, the way that some people's lives are worth less than others. Now, some might argue, well, actually, that, that that's really what cheap nature means, that, that to be part of nature is to be considered, you know, indigenous or, uh, you know, a, a colonized person or a woman or whatever it is. Um, but there's something specific about this this moment in, uh, in in capitalist history that cheap lives, like being able to identify, you know, here's the human surplus, whether it's, you know, in particular mm-hmm. in Europe at the moment, it's, it's migrants, mm-hmm. um, that th- these people are disposable in a way that other people are not. And it points to the way that states operate to cheapen those lives, even if the cheapening of those lives is actually quite expensive. You, so I want to, there is some elements into that which, which I found fantastic, mm. and I think we need to remind them. So there are these seven cheap things, cheap nature we're going to discuss, cheap money, cheap work, cheap care, cheap food, cheap energy, and cheap lives. Mm. And you mentioned, well, Capitalism avoids paying its bills, but also within the book, you mentioned that cheapness is the strategy, the set of strategies to manage relationships between capitalism and the web of li- and the web of life that's right. by temporarily fixing capitalism crisis. Mm-hmm. And I think that's you unpack a number of terms here. So it's strategies. So it's not by accident. N- none of this is by accident, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, second, it's between capitalism and the web of life, because you mentioned web of life in t- instead of nature, instead of, you know, this fungible, uh, arbitrary thing. And then lastly, you also mention fixing capitalism crisis, which is a kind of a perpetuating vi- vicious circle somehow. Right. And so I'm wondering, how, what, is this, what are some of these strategies to, to make things cheap? Well, I mean, let's take the most recent one, uh, where in the United States, for instance, we had uh, Silicon Valley Bank collapse, mm. and then a number of others, as, uh, in uh, you know, one by one by one, these um, uh, undercapitalized uh, medium-sized banks. Um, what happened in in these relationships was a banking crisis that threatened to sprawl through the international financial system. Um, now, this banking crisis was predictable, and it, there was even uh, you know, a certain degree of regulation that might have prevented it that was then uh, taken away by the, uh, by, by the Trump administration. But even the regulation that did exist uh, was poorly implemented. Um, and you would expect that, if it were true, that the, the government is really the, the executive arm of the bourgeoisie. You, you would expect the, this regulation to be badly implemented. And so it, you know, it came to pass that there was a banking crisis. What did the state do? Even with interest rates at a very high level, uh, and you can understand interest rates as you know, the cheapness of money, uh, the, the government found uh, billions of dollars to be able to re, recapitalize these banks or secure the, the loans or the, the deposits of the depositors in this bank. Uh, and I thought that, you know, that, that's an example of how uh, capitalism necessarily generates crisis because you know, banks, bourgeoisie, government—you know, the, the, this is this is a, a normal, pro, you know, sort of a predictable part of the uh, the, the banking world. Um, but it's also predictable that then the government will step in and find cheap money, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that process of a, a crisis that comes from the the natural workings of uh, the, you know, of capitalist enterprise then is generated that comes to a head uh, and there there are strategies that are developed to be able to to fix those crises and again we're, we're using the idea of this, the, the the fix um mm-hmm. that uh, understands that this is a sort of temporary patch on the crisis of capitalism but then the fix will come from elsewhere uh, one of the ideas that's central in our book is the idea of the frontier yes um uh you know, one of the early examples of the frontier is the sort of the, the process of exploration of the discovery of the new world, um, and th- these are ways of finding new frontiers with new resources, uh, new zones in which, um, you know, by the application of labour, 
uh, and the extraction and accumulation of resources. Uh, you can uh, find ways of fixing a crisis that, that, that's happening elsewhere in the capitalist system. Uh, so whether it's in the, the world of banking or whether it's you know, Elon Musk wanting to colonize Mars, uh, there are plenty of zones in which we can see these frontiers. Um, but you don't have to go to Mars to find these frontiers. You can also just find them in the Amazon. You can mm. find them in the ways that our daily lives are becoming increasingly uh, sort of uh, zones of extraction. You can, f you can see it in an Uber. Mm. Uh, so all of these are you know, new and interesting frontiers that, that, again, capitalists have found to be able to fix crises that, ha that, that propagate elsewhere in the, in, within the capitalist system. Yeah, I, I love this element of frontiers indeed, uh, because they also help us understand that it's just a exportation or, you know, externalization of the problem until we have no more. Exactly. <laughs> and we're at this place where we have no more. Um, Perhaps so. You have a couple of examples which take all of these cheap strategies together. Mm -hmm. uh, I think perhaps the the most striking one is Madeira, uh, how it went from, you know, reconfiguration of uh, within the web of life. Um, it started by having, let's say, um, it suffered colonialism, it suffered exploitation, it suffered different waves of extraction going from wood to wheat to sugar to, to people. Mm -hmm. So perhaps it, I think the value also of this book is to situate it in examples. Right. Um, because, you know, it can be overwhelming. All of these elements can be understood. But then how do we see them? Could you perhaps uh, elaborate on the example of Madeira a bit with these seven cheap things and what do they mean? Sure. So the, the island of Madeira was one of the earliest uh, in the sort of archipelago of Portuguese colonialism. Um, and uh, initially it was a, a, an uh, Isla do Madeira. I, I wish I could mm. pronounce Portuguese better than I can. Uh, but it means the island of wood, right? Mm. It's, it's an island filled with trees. <clears throat> and initially uh, the trees were used for shipbuilding. Um, then, uh, once the, the trees had been cleared, uh, it was used a little bit for, for wheat growing. Uh, but then uh, the, the Portuguese brought hydrological engineers from Egypt um, who, had, you know, who, who were among the most sophisticated uh, engineers of waterways on the planet. Uh, they created these systems of uh, irrigation that allowed the production of one of the, you know, the, the world's most expensive crops, which at that time was sugar. Um, and through the uh, application of capital from Genoa, uh, and so you, know, you, you have a lot of trade happening between uh, Madeira and uh, Genoa. In fact, what, one of the captains of the ships that goes backwards and forwards is uh, Christopher Columbus. Um, he was charged in court with, with uh, losing some property on that ship, on, on one of his journeys, and that's how we know that he was on his way back and forth from, from Madeira. Uh, he, his uncle was the, was it the governor of that's uh, Madeira? Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so you've got uh, this sort of, Loads of connections with Columbus. Columbus is another figure we can get to. <laughs> um, but so uh, on Madeira now, all, the, the wood gets turned not into construction material, but into fuel. Mm. Uh, and that fuel is used uh, to, to be able to distill sugarcane into these cones of sugar uh, that then were, were traded in Europe. But, you know, it doesn't happen by itself. You need labor. Uh, and uh, the, the labor that was brought on was enslaved people um, from other Portuguese colonies and from, from the Crusades. Um, and their labor was applied to this island. The capital came in. Uh, they were disciplined in ways that, uh, you know, th th their lives were already sort of regarded as cheap. Uh, and they uh, were, you know, th through this sort of process, it took about 75 years from, mm -hmm. for, for the island um, to uh, be turned from this island of wood into an island that, uh, you know, was entirely denuded of wood. And so it was about, you know, the 75-year cycle uh, in which you know, the, the work on the island relied on cheap care, relied on cheap nature, the, the wood was cheap fuel, uh, and uh, the, the food that the people on the island were given also had been, you know, w was uh, managed in a way to be able to keep them alive, though not, uh, you know, allow them to thrive in any way. Mm. Um, and all of us, you know, you have this sort of full system of the seven cheap things through which the, you know, the, the, a vast amount of resources are extracted to Europe, and then you have this husk of an island that remains a frontier, and I think that this is the interesting thing about frontiers. Even when they're exhausted, there is ample opportunity to reinvent. And this is where you know the sort of the, the, the techno futurists come in and say, well, you know, there have always been capitalist crises. There's always been someone smart.
smart enough to figure it out. Um, and it's true, uh, Madeira stops being an island where there is sugar production, and then, it then becomes a, a way station for the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, and now you can go to Madeira, um, and you know, Europeans get to go there on holiday and visit all the places where the sugar was made and look at all the graveyards where all the, where, where all the enslaved people were buried. That's you know, now, now it's a tourism destination, which is the, you know, the new reconstructed version of Madeira. Uh, but every time there is this process of reinvention that, again, capitalists like to celebrate. Well, you know, yes, there's been a crisis, but then look at this new technology, ter tourism, it's going to turn everything around. Uh, and I think that's, you know, th that points to this, a certain kind of psychology of amnesia where mm. that you need uh, uh, under capitalism to be able to say, well, you know, don't worry about that. We're awfully sorry. This island's called Island, you know, the, the, uh, the Island of Wood. There's not many trees here yet, but don't worry. You know, don't ask awkward questions about why you know, we live in a place called Oakland where there are no oak trees or why it is that we're in the Island of Wood with no trees. Um, let's instead worry about how it is we're going to develop this tourism industry. And that, uh, you know, th th this process of sort of constant amnesia, but also s saying, well, actually, the real problem is we don't have enough investment or tax breaks for the, ho for the hotel industry. That's our problem right now. These, uh, this process of a constant reinvention is the, the creative destruction of capital, right? I mean, you know, the, uh, one doesn't want to end, uh, underestimate how powerful that is, um, but one also wants to say, well, the, the, you know, this power comes from the, you know, the, the deep anxiety that, that uh, without these fixes, the, the system itself will fall apart. And that's why the fixes are central to the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 100%. And then I think over there, I mean, we also had stories before, like uh, the Black Death. I mean, even mm. before the capitalist system, there was already some... Uh, or pre-capitalist system, mm. the, the, these fixes existed in empires, existed in previous cities, uh, but also they exist um, today, right? I mean, today they, they're also... I think Madeira is so nice because it's a, well, it's a contained example mm. that has, as you say, in 70 years, everything has been transformed. Uh, most recently, it's, I think, a bit harder to elucidate these seven elements all together in one place um, and perhaps it's through products or through supply chains or through specific elements that we can see them once again mm -hmm. i think one of your favorite example are you know nuggets or chickens mm -hmm. uh, w which also encapsulate all of the the seven elements in one poor animal that wasn't even made to to exist right uh, well i mean one of the most capitalist objects, we argue, is the chicken nugget. Uh, and we w went for this example because uh, we were really trying to take a aim at people who use the term Anthropocene. Mm. Um, now, it, you know, uh, listeners will have heard of the, uh, the idea of the Anthropocene as this moment in geological history that uh, humans have altered the planet irre irrevocably. Uh, and if we look in the, uh, you know, in the fossil record, in the stratigraphic record, what are the signatures of the Anthropocene? Well, it's plastic, for example. You know, that by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the sea than uh, harvestable fish. There will be, uh, there are traces in, again, in the fossil record of our atmospheric nuclear weapons tests. Uh, but one of the, the signatures of you know, what, what, what some people are calling the Anthropocene is um, chicken bones, uh, because there, you know, the, the, the chicken is the world's most popular bird. There are the 12 billion chickens alive now, but not for long, right? There's 90 days from egg to nugget. Uh, and every year we go through 50 billion chickens and that number's only going up. Um, so trillions of chicken bones already in the fossil record. Uh, and that's uh, a sign that it's, you know, it's not a natural part of being human that there should be so many chicken bones. There's some process that mm. makes makes it so that if there's any civilization after Earth, they'll find all these chicken bones. They'll be like, well, what, what, what generated, happened, yeah. right? Uh, and the story isn't about humans being humans because, you know, uh, before capitalism, humans weren't relying on chickens that much. Uh, you know, this is a, a bird that comes from East Asia that's domesticated. <clears throat> Certainly it, it spreads around the world, but it's um, not cultivated in the, the sort of volume that mm. you see today. So the, the, the fact that you can take the chicken and do with it what you want, that's you know, an ex example of cheap nature. But you need workers to, uh, you know, to, to take this chicken and turn it into a nugget. Uh, and the cheap work here, I think, is very interesting. Uh, we found a story, alas, after we'd finished the book, uh, of uh, some chicken executives in Oklahoma in the United States. Uh, they realized that it's very expensive to have workers work on the chicken plant, particularly at night. 
Um, you know, working on a chicken plant is always underpaid. Uh, you know, these businesses in America had, had used uh, prison labor that were paid nothing or 25 cents an hour, something you know, very, uh, you know, very small. But even that was too much. Uh, and so uh, what these executives did was set up something called Christian Alcoholics and Addicts in Recovery. Uh, and it's a really clever organization, right? It's uh, about helping people who are suffering the opioid epidemic, which is another capitalist crisis. We don't even time to get into that. Um, but so here are people who are in withdrawal from, uh, you know, from, from uh, opioids. Uh, they could either be sent to jail or, or they can be sent to this place. Christian alcoholics and addicts in recovery. Uh, and by day, they pray to the good Lord Jesus Christ. And then at night, they are sent to work as part of their re rehabilitation on the chicken production line. Uh, where they are, don't have to be insured, they, they'll lose a finger, they'll, they'll suffer repetitive strain industry, injury. But this is part of their penance mm. uh, for having fallen, uh, having become addicts. And we thought, well, this is a really interesting mirroring of the first colonial encounters in the New World, where indigenous people were uh, also enslaved uh, and you know, made to work for most of the, the week. And then on Sunday, the, they used to pray to Jesus. Here, the relationship, you know, the, the, the time coding is a, a slightly different. But the, 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 the object is exactly the same, that you're using people who are incarcerated, literally, to be able to work for you for free. Uh, and so there's an example of cheap work. Uh, of course, you know, people's bodies get broken by this process. But when they get spat out of the Christian Alcoholics and Addicts in Recovery, it's up to communities usually to look after the people who are disabled. Uh, that, that's the idea of cheap care. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The, the, the chickens themselves are sort of hyper-processed and turned into food that is used, uh, you know, that is fed to other people cheaply in order to be able to manage, you know, the, the budgets of the working class. Cheap food is certainly part of the dividend in, in mm. the United States. All of this requires uh, fossil fuel, either, you know, butane to uh, run, or, you know, uh, to, to, to run the, to warm the hen houses, or, you know, fossil fuels to, to uh, oil the machinery and the transports and, and the logistics of the, the, the food industry, um, uh, you know, to be able to provide the feed, all of this. Uh, so again, cheap food, um, cheap energy, and uh, you know, now we're moving into cheap money. Um, you need cheap money to be able to uh, you know, sell these products. In, in the United States, you can buy chicken nuggets at, say, a, a KFC. A, mm -hmm. you know, used to be Kentucky Fried Chicken. Is it KFC here as well? I guess so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, if those are small businesses, then you can get a, a concessional loan from the federal government, up to $2 million. Uh, and, you know, again, cheap money there. And then, of course, if you look at who it is that's in the, the production plants whose work is exploited all the way along, um, it, these are workers who are uh, usually people of color and disproportionately women. Mm. Uh, and, again, the, the, the lives of these people, and, you know, and, and often immigrants, the lives of these people don't matter as much as, the, you know, the, the, the profiteers or even, uh, indeed, the consumers. So all the way, seven cheap things from, you know, fr from this chicken all the way to the nugget. Uh, and that's why we wanted to, to, to say, well, it shouldn't be the Anthropocene. It, mm. This should be the Capitalocene. Mm. Uh, and if we call it the Capitalocene, then actually you're in a much better place because it's not all humans who are part of the problem here. There are indigenous civilizations that would never think of doing something like this. Uh, and indigenous people are humans. Uh, and so it's wrong to say, well, this is Anthropocene, because uh, you know, here are some humans who are not doing that. It's the capitalist system that's driving this. And therefore, let's call it the Capitalocene, because it's a much, much more accurate word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, and I think we can go on with a number of different of mm -hmm. such examples, which which I think enable us to anchor it once again. I mean, there are people... I mean, the, the workers have to wear diapers to work all day, all day or all night, as you mentioned, in order to do so. I mean, when we talk about conditions of labor mm. in the U.S., th this is, I mean, you know, we've reached the peak of, of d dishonesty and uh, not, not being able to, well, to feel like a human being anymore. Yeah. So it robs many people as well lives, uh, well, or dignity at least. Um, so... We mentioned about the frontiers. That's something that strikes me as a as a powerful concept that is worrisome as well, because we ha we have reached many limits. We have reached many frontiers. Um, do we? Ha I mean, how does capitalism run when there is no more frontiers, or what what, what happens when we run out? Because I feel that. Do we double down on people that were exploited once, this triple 
exploitation of people in climate change or w what happens there? Well, uh, w there are a couple of things to look at. Um, one of the ways we situate the capitalist moment is by looking at pre-capitalist history. Uh, and, you know, capitalism emerges from a crisis. It uh, emerges from a crisis in Europe that is about climate change. It's certainly about the Black Death. Uh, and it's about the economics of food production. Uh, you know, before capitalism, feudalism worked by applying more and more labor, feudal labor, and, you know, serfs, to particular bits of land. And because the weather was very cooperative in, that, in this moment, um, it was possible to have a certain amount of sort of exploitation of the land that was uh, essentially sort of through the management practices of commoning and of uh, you know, you know, agricultural practices in Europe that, that recognized that you needed to uh, nonetheless save soil. You couldn't just sort of pull resources out of it all the time, but the, the metabolism of the soil itself was respected. Um, the, those systems were robust. Bust. But when the Black Death swept through Europe, all of a sudden, uh, serfs, peasants re realized that they had the upper hand in negotiating a different kind of uh, sort of post you know, post feudal moment. Um, and there was an explosion of different kinds of possibility. And I think that this often gets forgotten at, you know, in, in the transition from feudalism to capitalism. It seems like, oh, well, they tried one thing, then they moved to another. But in fact, at the, the end of an era is a time of an explosion of lots of different ideas. Mm. Um, and so you see a number of things happening in the transition from feudalism to capitalism, like uh, peasant riots, for example, peasant rebellions, um, claims on the forest, uh, you, know, the, the, the charter, the, you know, the charters of the forest, for example, uh, that trying to expand uh, a, a really quite communist idea of how the world should be and how it is that, that we should hold the world in common. Uh, and I think that that's, that's rather interesting. And Jason, mm -hmm. Jason's new work is precisely looking at the history of these uh, uh, you know, uh, pre-capitalist communist ideas. Um, and that's you know, the, the possibility here uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, in fact, as we head towards crisis, there, there will be lots of um, you know, alternatives to capitalism that emerge and flourish. But what we also notice is that uh, you know, what feudal elites in Europe wanted was either a return to feudalism, so that there was a, a, a sort of move to sort of re-peasantize, um, but a few of them uh, engaged in this kind of colonial capitalism. Uh, and they were the ones who ultimately prevailed, and they prevailed through a combination not just of uh, the success of their economic exploitation, but also the, the way that they were able to turn money into weapons and back into money again. Uh, the arms industry is an important part of the mm -hmm. transition, uh, and the, the ready deployment of large garrisons of state-sponsored force are precisely what it is that allows these, uh, you know, that allows capitalism to prevail. So, you know, capitalism is born of war, um, and it will mm. it'll die that way. Um, and I think that this is the worry here uh, that actually, while there are lots of social movements around the world doing incredible things, almost all of them are being, you know, all the activists in these organisations are. Um, seeing rates of assassination and state-sponsored violence that are much higher than they were even 10 years ago. Um, this is pointing to a sort of general crisis with the rise of fascism again mm. uh, that I am very worried about. And J Jason and I note in the book that we're not uh, Panglossians here. We're, we're not saying, well, of course, capitalism is going to end so that we can have lots of communist utopias flourish. Uh, we're pointing to, to what, what emerges from crisis is not just uh, you know, these wonderful communities where you know, labor is not exploited and care is valued, but also fascist communities in which uh, the tendencies of the cheapening, particularly of lives, are taken to their ultimate extreme, where uh, people are returned back to nature, being considered subhuman, in order that they be exploited. And uh, I mentioned in, in the talk yesterday yes. that you know, I, I, I live in Texas, where already we have um, Nazis and you know, sort of uh, fascists of various kinds who have embraced the logic of climate change mm. and now say, well, look, yeah, of course climate change is real. Uh, but the, what that means is that we need to guard our national resources much more tightly and we need to recognize that it is immigrants who are taking our stuff and therefore they must die. And that was part of the manifesto that uh, one of the, uh, you know, one of the, the mass shooters in El Paso 
had. You know, th th this was his logic and his justification for killing, uh, you know, uh, I think it was a dozen migrants. Mm -hmm. And it was, uh, or a dozen people of color. We don't even know whether they're migrants and it doesn't matter. Um, but it, it, th that was his idea. Um, and so I, I worry about that mm -hmm. because th it's certainly the case that, that when the far right you know, embraces climate change, and there's a far right uh, writer in the United States uh, who has already um, embraced some of the logic around the food system and is now advocating a certain kind of racial blood and soil uh, approach to, to, to transforming the food system in America. These kinds of ideas are equally possible um, uh, out of the end of, uh, of capitalism. And that's, that's a, a grave source for worry. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, I didn't know all of that. I mean, how well thought things seem to, to happen, right? I mean, they seem to organize at the same time. So it's these two parallel streams that seem to emerge, as you mentioned them. Mm -hmm. So if capitalism were to end through a crisis, how do we get out of this vicious circle? You mentioned reparation ecology, for instance. Mm -hmm. We also mentioned some social movements at the beginning via Campesina. We can also talk about the Zapatistas uh, or the MST. Mm -hmm. Can you provide with some alternative uh, storylines that we could, uh, you know, at least be inspired of? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, some of the work that in my latest book that I did with uh, a medical doctor, Rupa Maria. Uh, the book's called Inflamed, uh, and we're, we use the fact that most people's bodies are suffering some sort of chronic inflammation as a way of telling a story about how health and food uh, and capitalism uh, ha are bound together. Uh, and what we do is get to look at uh, social movements around the world that are doing it right. And a lot of these movements are indigenous and indigenous led. Uh, and that I, th I find very interesting uh, because again, you know, ca capitalism has not been total. Uh, capitalism needs these frontiers, and right now many of the frontiers, certainly in, in Turtle Island in, in what's called North America, is uh, are trying to move through indigenous land. Uh, indigenous protest movements have done more than any other policy in North America to be able to keep fossil fuels in the ground through direct action and through mobilizing uh, around being able to protect sacred spaces. Uh, that, I think, you know, if, if you want a policy that keeps fossil fuels in the ground for a decade more effectively than anything else, th this, is your, this is your policy. It's to, to put your bodies uh, on the front line guided by indigenous movements. Uh, that, I think, is a, a, a terrific example. Uh, but then also, and, and remember, you don't have to be indigenous to be part of the movement. <laughs> Uh, you, you, you can take direction from indigenous leaders. Uh, you, you don't have to claim indigeneity yourself. Um, and I think that, that that's important, particularly with the rise of uh, in in the United States of the, the phenomenon of pretendian of, of often white people who are uh, who claim uh, an indigenous grandmother back in the day, and uh, it, it turns out that actually they're they're, uh, they're as white as the driven snow. Um, so the but but I think that's. Uh, an example, but then look at the MST, uh, the, you know, the Rural Landless Workers Movement in Brazil, uh, who have been occupying uh, unused land legally, by the way. You know, the, the, there's, there's uh, in the Napoleonic Code uh, for l land use in Brazil, if land isn't being used for a social purpose after seven years, if it's been used for speculation, but nothing's happening there, then it reverts back to being accessible to people who will improve it. Uh, and that means th this land is being occupied by the MST. It's terrific. Um, but you know, th what they're doing is not just farming and engaging in uh, traditional agriculture. They're doing really cutting-edge agroecological uh, mm. food systems where uh, they're sequestering carbon, but they're increasing biodiversity. They're not using industrial uh, fertilizers and pesticides. They're uh, making sure that everyone gets fed a, a balanced and nutritious diet, and they're working working together to be able to build these communities and defend them uh, against the predations of the, you know, the violence that uh, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, capitalist landowners would like to mete out on them. Uh, but you, you don't even have to think of rural areas. In, in South Africa, uh, I'm lucky enough to work with the movement called Abatlali Basim Jondolo, which is uh, uh, people who live in shacks. It's a, a movement of now 110,000 people uh, who are... Uh, you know, uh, fighting for dignity and for housing, um, but are also engaged in uh, agroecological commoning as well. So yeah, we've got some really good examples around the world. Um, you know, I could go on, but I think you know, if people want to know more, La Via Campesina has some really good examples in their stable. Yeah. Um, so what is to 
Is the idea to generalize these movements and extend them into a mass population? You, I mean, we also in, are in this framework of the Beyond Growth Conference, mm -hmm. and there is this story about degrowth as well, and how does that converge? Does it converge? You were worried, actually, that uh, degrowth might be just BS, or this new mm -hmm. term, if it does not include migration challenges, if it does not include uh, racial challenges, if it does not include many other topics that... Uh, well, seem to to be missed in this equation, or how do we converge these, you know, uh, movement or popul uh, popular movements, and then at the same time, uh, top level challenges? I, I think that, that the, uh, I mean, that there is a way in which all of these movements uh, can be understood as organizations of radical care, uh, mm. and what they're doing is caring for one another and caring for the planet uh, and caring that their exploitation and cheapening should stop. Um, I'm interested in the idea of the low carbon economy um, that is made possible by regimes of care that are radically egalitarian. Uh, and if there is a generalization of that idea, I'm all for it. Mm. Uh, but I also think that, that again, we, we you can't have this generalization without remembering how we got here. Otherwise, we, we fall back into this idea of you know, the, the capitalist amnesia. Uh, and that's what worries me about degrowth, is that you can't have a conversation about degrowth in Europe without understanding that all the wealth that we're surrounded by. You know, people should know, right now we're in Brussels, uh, right? We're, we're in Belgium, w <laughs> which was made possible by the exploitation of the Congo under King Leopold, which he, you know, he, owned, the, he owned the country. Uh, was it the, the Congo Free State was was uh, was what it was called. It, it, it was owned as a piece of private property by the King of Belgium, um, and and yet we, at the opening of the conference we heard uh, you know, uh, Ursula von der Leyen talking about how uh, you know, how wonderful it is that our green hydrogen targets, which Europe is on course to, to to miss entirely, but how our green hydrogen is going to make you know, new worlds possible, and uh, you know how we're you know the, 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 everyone's going to be driving a Tesla, uh, and where does the where do the raw materials for the production of these things come from, but from the, the remnants of Belgian colonialism? Uh, you can't imagine this future without reckoning with its past. Mm. Uh, and I worry that degrowth is avoiding the reckoning. Mm. Uh, and not just in terms of European colonialism, though that's important, but you know, India is entirely ca capable of uh, taking the, the mantle the British gave them and deepening the exploitation, particularly of indigenous people uh, and of the working class in India. Uh, so it's, you know, th 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 there needs to be a reckoning also, not just country by country, but also recognizing that there's a reckoning, uh, there's a class reckoning that's due here. Mm -hmm. um, I think perhaps to to end this, I, I think you you managed to tell stories in in interesting and different ways uh, through media, through films, through books. Um, what is so attractive to you to to tell these stories in different media, or how do you go about having this non traditional career mm -hmm. between? Uh, you know, very technocratic to activist to scholar to mixing all of this together once again. W what drives you? How do you go about as a as a human being? Well, I mean, honestly, I I never wanted to be a writer. Um, as I say, I I wanted to write the con write the equation and then go to the you know just just, just go to the beach and play computer games or whatever it is. Um, but uh, I. Uh, found that you know, the, the reason I left Food First in part, uh, this organization I was working with uh, in, in the early 2000s, um, was because I was writing this stuff. No one was reading it. Uh, yeah, I was writing fantastic policy papers on the World Trade Organ. Really good, really good <laughs> analysis. No one gave a shit. Um, and that's not their fault. That's my fault. And and so I wrote Stuffed and Starved as a way of saying, well, look, here, if, if you don't particularly want to care, care about the WTO's agreement on agriculture and its sanitary and phytosanitary measures, you know, I get that. But <laughs> here, here's a way in which I can make you care about it. Uh, and so that's why I wrote uh, Stuffed and Starved. And I'm, I, you know, it, it's, it doesn't come naturally to me. I, it took 26 drafts of that, of the proposal and 16, 17 drafts of the book to get it to where it was okay. And I'm still not happy with it. I still would go back and rewrite it completely, you know, considerably if I could. Um, but that's been the, the journey I'm on, where uh, I find that I, I want to help folk I want to teach people. I mean, I, 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 I kind of have that bone in me that, that, that enjoys teaching. Uh, and I want to work with people to say, well, you think this, but actually, let, let me take you on a journey 
And I have to take you on a journey because otherwise you won't recognize where you, you know, where you started from. So let's go on this journey. And if people are going to be on a journey with you, you have to feed them. You have to entertain them. You have to you know, keep people engaged. Uh, and that's why, even though I'm, I, I prefer the theory, I prefer, I mean, I would write mm. uh, like Deleuze and Guattari if I could. Uh, but I would, you know, no one's going to read that. Uh, and people are going to read things like, uh, you know, the world ecology ideas in, in Seven Cheap Things. Uh, and then, you know, it, it, particularly these days, it's it's entirely the case that you know, ten years ago I could say to my students, "Here's a book a week," uh, and my students would be like, oh, "I don't want to do that," <laughs> um, but they would do it. Yeah. And now it's really, you know, it's almost impossible. The, uh, and that's in part because of the attention economy being much more in, in students' lives. But it's also the case that uh, you know the culture of book reading isn't there, and uh, it, you know it's also the case that students are much more exploited, and so they're working two or three jobs, and they're you know it's it's, it's hard for them to pay attention. Uh, but it's also the case that it's not just students who I want to communicate with. Mm. Uh, so uh, I, I, I did a documentary film called The Ants and the Grasshopper. It took us 10 years of filming. Uh, and we uh, then, you know, and in the end, it started off being going to be narrated by Jake Gyllenhaal. It was going to be one of these things that was on <laughs> prestige t TV, and it was going to be like a, a, you know, one of these things. Um, but it, it didn't work with the story that we wanted to tell. It was a story about a Malawian farmer and her life, and it, it only made sense for her to be the narrator in the film. So we had to decolonize ourselves. Uh, but that means that this is a film that's not going to be commercially successful. Uh, instead, what we had, we raised money for an engagement campaign so that the film was screening in places that films don't normally screen. So we, we screen a lot of churches and a lot of town halls and a lot of community groups uh, because it's, the, the, it's a way of reaching a new audience um, and connecting ideas around race and capital uh, and the environment in ways that these, you know, that, that, that folk don't normally get to think about. And I'm excited about that. I mean, I, 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 I enjoyed making the film. Um, you know, if, if, if I get behind the camera for another one, it, it'll, it'll have to be for a very good reason. Uh, but I, 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 I again, I, I don't do this because I desperately want to. Uh, I do it because it's what the moment needs. Um, and even if that moment 10 years ago was different to the moment now, I think you know, this film is useful right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, perhaps to wrap it up, mm. there is, well, we've touched a number of points uh, and I think these can, once again, I've tried to make them as accessible as possible and you've certainly done so. How can we summarize some of these elements? Perhaps what, what is a message to to be mindful of when we try to, to look at all of these um, interconnected systemic challenges. Mm. Is there, <laughs> I don't know if, it, if mantra is the word, but is there something that we can remind ourselves of paying attention to some specific elements in order to, to always keep in mind, retrace, uh, well, being mindful of this amnesia, collective amnesia, um, and br bring this to, to the future? That's a great, great question, Aristide. What a, what a wonderful way to end. I mean, I, I think the, I mean, the, the the sort of story here is always about hidden things, right? Um, and if we're looking at the moment, then I would say, well, look, who, who's doing the care work uh, is the, the hidden thing to be mindful of. But that can succumb to the amnesia. Uh, and so I think that the, the, the question is, who did the care work so that we could be here? Uh, mm. And if we ask that question, then we ask not only how is it that we happen to be having this conversation right here, right now, but whose work in the past was not just occluded, but made it possible for the recognized work to happen. And that brings us back to understanding the work of women and usually women of color in the global south, whose work made it possible for us to be here today and who, whose names are not on any of the buildings here. Uh, and asking who's, yeah, whose care made it possible for us to be here uh, is both a way of you know, embodying a certain kind of gratitude to our, our, you know, our ancestors, but recognizing that the way we move certainly here in Europe it depends on other people's ancestors, mm -hmm. other people's grandmothers. Uh, and without their care for the resources and the labor that made this wealth possible, um, you know, the, the ideas of degrowth are for nothing. <laughs> Any books or films that you would like to suggest uh, to, to go deeper on this past care or remembering care or acknowledging care? Uh, I mean, everything by Silvia Federici is fantastic, obviously. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we devoted a, a quite a lot of w ways of thinking about that care, the, the care that, um, uh, you know, that, that women do, 
but also the, the care that nature offers in Inflamed, uh, which I did mm. with Rupa Maria. Um, so th there are a few references in there that, that might be worth checking out too. Great. Well, Rush, thanks so much. It's thanks so been, much, Aristide. I really enjoyed this conversation. It has been an awesome pleasure, not only to, to well, to have the privilege to, to spend an hour with you. Um, also, please share this discussion with people. I think uh, I think it's going to touch a number of you and a number of your colleagues. Um, also, don't hesitate to look at uh, the other episode with Jason so that you, you get the, the two pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, it has been challenging for me because I, it's not my, you know, I, I was or I, I still am perhaps of more of a technocratic point of view that I'm slowly changing and I love uh, getting guided or getting help to, to do so. So, yeah, thanks to you. Thanks, uh, Raj, as well. And thanks to Andreas as well for, for welcoping us here. That's it. Fantastic. Thank you.